Hi, welcome to Thinking Green. Uh, we are continuing our uh, series on local nonprofit organizations in the New London area that really contribute tremendously to our quality of life here. And today we're going to talk about the Custom House that uh, most of you have seen on Bank Street in New London. Uh, I guess we can flash a little photo of, uh, of the Custom House and then We'll talk about uh, its programs and um, what's been going on there because of, uh, you know, the last few years have been very strange. Very quiet. So my guest today is uh, Susan Tamnulevich, who is the executive director uh, of the New London Maritime Society, mm -hmm. which is housed at the Custom House. And uh, we're going to talk about different things that have gone on. Yeah. So has the last year uh, had a process of like, I don't know, starting to open things up a little bit? Yes, yes. And, and the, the pictures that you have that you'll be showing are about our um, year of the lighthouse. We have uh, three lighthouses for which we are federal stewards. And it was very... Um, it was very competitive to get those lighthouses, and we have, um, there have been three years where we've worked on a, a couple of them, but the public has not had access. And one of the most important reasons that we're given the lighthouses for nothing, not even one dollar, it's just for free by wow. the federal government, is because we provide education and access to the public because, as you know, we built the lighthouses, we paid for them, we manned them, we've done all this maintenance over years, and now they're owned by us as a public steward. You know, it's not like the Maritime Society can say, oh, gee, we're short of money, uh, I guess we'll just sell one of those lighthouses. We can, we can never sell it. It is uh, something that we would give back to the federal government. We're, we're just in trust for the public. Now, the New London mm -hmm. Harbor Lighthouse, that one, um, I mean, that's really famous. It's been on a postage stamp. Yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very famous. And we had um, uh, a very long lawsuit about that lighthouse, about preventing public access, which we won in 2019. And we opened up again, and we're all ready to go and giving tours again. And there was a lot of pent-up interest. And then COVID hit. So we have used these last couple years at uh, Harbor Light. We had a, a, a pretty sizable grant from the state of Connecticut that we had to match by a quarter. So we had almost $100,000 that we used to put in fences to be good neighbors. you know, And uh, we did landscaping. We put some planters in. It's, it's beautiful. We also did some restoration with one of the Sea Scout. Uh, one of the scouts wanted to get a, his, uh, the equivalent of what a, a Boy Scout, Eagle Scout would be. And he did a project where he painted and redid a lot of things up in the lantern room so that in 2014, 2015, we redid the masonry in the exterior of the lighthouse. This year, we ourselves did the landscaping, which is almost done, and this young man did inside the lantern room. So it's all been 
harbor light is in quite excellent shape and we wanted people to see it so that was just one of one of the lighthouses so we decided to make this year the year of the lighthouse because <clears throat> people would have forgotten that there was all that access and we wanted people back to be working as volunteers and and joining us again and I think it has been a challenge to get people out of just thinking that yeah. you know everything is done remotely these days yeah. and I know there are some online programs too but the, there's nothing really the same as, as being there and no. I, I guess I wanted to we do have some pictures of the lighthouse I don't you know the studio has new equipment yeah. you'll probably notice that um, oh there it is that the resolution and the lighting are a lot better than they were mm -hmm. but some of the sort of workarounds we used to do to get uh, our images on the screen don't really work right anymore. So um, the next couple images, I think one or two we can see, are of, the, um, of that Harper Lighthouse. I think there was an aerial view. Yeah, isn't that a wonderful picture? Your drones have really transformed uh, photography. Yeah, I, and you can see, I mean, it's really in the middle of a neighborhood on Pequot yeah. Avenue, yeah. Um, which maybe was a, a little bit of a mixed bag in your uh, fight to get it, uh, be able to open it as a museum. But, but it, it's wonderful that it's really right here. And this year, across the whole year, we've only had about 100 people visit. We, we have a limited number of uh, of tours and it's not like we have thousands of people dying to get in it's a very nice local thing and in fact most of our visitors are local they love it and I'm thinking it would be a terrific place for our students to visit it's you know part well, of uh, you're gonna, New London history you're renting you're renting my heart because uh, we did a program with the third graders today and we used to bring the classes to the lighthouse but part of the zoning uh, uh, restrictions that were put on us were that we cannot bring school children to the lighthouse and that seems uh, I, I don't I can't I don't even have okay. a way to talk about that but I will say that um, we did do one thing though this year is we got a wonderful grant from the New London Water Authority Veolia which allowed us to sponsor tickets for um, New London families. So anyone who wanted to go, who had a child in New London, um, it could be grandparents, whatever, and siblings, all of that, for $5 a piece, they could visit Harbor Light and they could visit Ledge Light, which required a boat trip out right. there, and $5 a piece. And we had loads of people, I think about 300 altogether, who took advantage of that. and. We hope to do it again next year because people are very, very proud. See, so here we oh. have um, local local child uh, and her mother at the uh, in the upper left. The family; those are the neighbors who live in the big white house. Oh, great! When they, when they had most of the the visitors are neighbors. When they came, uh, when the daughter got married, they brought in wave after wave of visitors, five at a time, to, to tour as part of the wedding party. So that was kind of nice. Um, here's another New London family out there visiting in the Lighthouse, part of our program. Um, here they are going out to Ledge Lighthouse. The um, Ledge Lighthouse, uh, we have uh, taken on board management of that lighthouse. We've been working with the Ledge Light Foundation, and that's going to change in the new year, um, because you know we're actually the responsible federal stewards. Now, so. how long have you been re uh, responsible for the stu stewardship of Ledge Light? Um, since 2015, I think. Mm. 2015, and we, they had had they had done a lot of work out there when Todd, the when the um, Coast Guard automated the light. They just sort of left, and the Ledge Light Foundation formed, and they didn't do a lot for a long time. When Todd Gibstein moved back to town, he did a tremendous amount. Oh, wow. And in fact, their very first public tour and the publication of his book about 
one of the lighthouses. I think it wasn't Ledge. I think it was about Ray's Frog. Um, coincided with our first lighthouse weekend when we had all sorts of festivities. But since he left, the membership of that group has sort of fallen off and um, you know, we've got to be more responsible. So we took a look at it and over the last year did a lot of um, uh, consulting with places like Connecticut Landmarks who have multiple properties and said, what, how, do you, how do you manage them? And the United States Lighthouse Society and they said, you have to have it under the board. So at our, me at our board meeting in November, I think for the first time in 40 years, because uh, it was our 40th, the start of our 40th year, we amended our bylaws. <coughs> so all of our properties will have board. Um, and of course, the Ledge Light Foundation, or whoever it is, um, they can, uh, wh whoever wishes to join, can join our committee. But the oversight has to be by us because it just, we're responsible. We, we took it on. We, we have to answer to the National Park Service. So now we can we see do. the picture now. Uh, uh, yeah. Now, is there preservation work being done now or planned for the near future? Well, for the there, there, edge light? there are a lot of problems. And uh, not much has been done over the last several years, which was part of our concern. So they brought out um, engineers and uh, got a report done, and we have uh, architects who are going to do a more holistic approach. So they ought to be able to work together. This set of pictures is from when we did a fundraiser out at uh, Fisher's Island. We're starting up our, uh, our uh, campaign to restore Race Rock, and I'm really proud to say that uh, we actually got a grant for $100,000 to wow. start with next year. See, people love these lighthouses. They're very, that woman, that's a real tattoo on her leg. Um, <laughs> the, the people people have so much uh, feeling for the lighthouses that it's very, imp and, and you know, working with three of them, we can do so many, so much more than working with them individually. You know, we'll, we'll have the architects who did the plan for Race Rock do the plan now for Ledge Light. Oh, and yeah, people people complain all the time. You know, we know so sooner we get out of one frying pan, and then people say, "Why don't you paint the lighthouse?" And we had <laughs> just fixed it. It's only been about seven years. It was seven years since we had done the repainting and and quite a bit of work at that lighthouse. Why, you know, oh, it's it's shameful. Why don't you repaint? So we got someone who volunteered to rig up a. Wa a way to wash it. They oh. put a um, like a bath at the bottom to collect all the water and then they shot the hoses down oh, on the nice. side very very controlled and very carefully and they and what we've been doing lately is instead of uh, you know because we don't have any money we do GoFundMe campaigns and they, if you don't like it Contribute, and we will um, we will wash the lighthouse. Absolutely, we will, we want to do it too, and we did, and that was great. It was four thousand five hundred dollars. It was very expensive, but we did it. And, and now that they have the um, apparatus, if we were to do it uh, more frequently, it would be less expensive, and and you know less. And I'm thinking uh, that we de you know anyone who has a house knows that. Especially on the north side. Yeah, it, the north was bad. Yeah, you get green stuff growing yeah. on, the, on the walls. Yeah, and we have this very special um, Edison coating paint. It's sort of an encaustic, I think you call it, where it expands and it's all of that. And it does not promote uh, that kind of growth, but after seven years. So it's good. And, and if we keep on top of it now, it'll... it'll look beautiful and the grounds are spectacular i think you probably have some pictures coming up of the grounds yeah in fact um i was wondering if we could go back to the slide number three okay. um that shows i don't know i hope it's yeah. not too hard to go backwards yeah this uh, but is, slide number three oh, yeah, yeah. I, um to talk a, a little bit about the landscaping at that uh, lighthouse isn't that beautiful so th this yeah. upper left 
part of it that's mm -hmm. what it looked like a couple years ago well yeah it's what it looked like in October of 2021 which is say just about oh a year yeah ago. A year and before that before that it was just like a meadow which is nothing wrong with the meadow but it was not um, not great really and uh, we needed to bring it sort of into focus and make it a public like a like a pocket park yeah, and, and part of the issue is you have the public coming through. Yes. And they're not going to walk through a meadow. They're not going to walk through a meadow. So what we, what we did is, is um, the end, at, if, if you go back a slide, uh, right at the ledge, there had been a building. And where that building was, we put planters on the side. We wanted to give our neighbors, since they objected so much to us, uh, we wanted to give them as much privacy as possible. And we wanted privacy, too, because they, you know, um, are right sure. there, right? So it's now, it's extremely beautiful and pleasant. And we have um, a, a bit of a lawn, periwinkle in the shady part on the, on the ground, and these uh, native grasses growing in the planters, and they should get up to six feet in another couple of years. It'll be great. It's very, very beautiful, and I can't wait for next year. We have, we also were given a gift for ten thousand dollars, which will pay for a new gate, out front, and proper signage. So how did, so how does parking work out there? I well, know that um, that had been an, an issue that the neighbors were concerned about. I don't know why, because there are public beaches on either side, not sure. public, private beaches, but which yeah. have incredible attendance. And there is parking on the street, across the street, and we only bring in one group at a time, one group so of five. So it really hasn't become an issue at all. It's not, it, it was never an issue, frankly. Um, it's, we don't have large events. Now, we did want to have, um, we wanted to have an open house for the community like we used to where people could walk down and five at a time go inside the lighthouse, and we were forbidden that. In fact, there were some other, other uses we wanted to have, like someone wanted to do some filming. We were, that was forbidden. A Coast Guard person wanted to re-up you know, their service. That was forbidden. So yeah. they just did it themselves, you know, because they, they man the lights still. Right. It's, a, it's a partnership between us and the Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard still mans the lights there. Yeah, they they uh, they keep it working. It's their oh, they own it. Now, I, while you're talking about the lights, because I hadn't even really thought of them, the lighthouses as being active. Um, yeah. Ledge light and and race rock. Do they also have oh, yeah. active lights? They're act they're active aids to navigation, and they're very very important. Particularly ledge. Uh, well, uh, actually, all three of them are important. Um, harbor light because there are shoals all around there and when the ferries come in they still aim when they get to, they aim right at uh, harbor light that keeps them in the channel but ledge light you know there's a ledge you, you see what's above the water and sometimes you can see black ledge but mostly it's underwater but just under the water and the lighthouse marks where that comes out from the grotten side and uh, is right on the channel and so that's very important. And it also has a foghorn now, you know. And uh, Race Rock, Race Rock is such a difficult uh, channel to come through because the uh, seabed drops so dramatically. It's like when the tides do what they do, it's like your finger over a hose. You know, it's this little opening for all this power. So the waters are always swirling. and. Honestly, I don't know how the kayakers do it. Kayakers are always going out to uh, race it rock. It seems kind of scary. <laughs> it's very, it's... One thing for a big ferry, yeah, they're well, probably fine. Yes, they're fine, usually. But, you know, yes. And, and, and so race rock is also extremely uh, uh, important. And we had pictures of uh, an event that the Henry Ferguson Museum on Fishers Island gave for us. We have a wonderful film that Pierce Rafferty, the um, director out there, made on the history of Race Rock Lighthouse. The, the picture that we just saw was of the special trips we did on just one weekend. Never before had there been trips to Little Gull, which is my actual real favorite lighthouse. Wow. And that was thrilling. 
um, yeah, that's that's it. It's it it's on either it's on the opposite side of the channel. Now, who? Uh, yeah, well, I guess Little Gold was kind of off of my radar screen. Is that uh, also an act of light there, and yes. who takes care of that? Yes. Um, uh, we we it was it was deaccessioned by the federal government. They have a process they go through. First, they will. Um, ask uh, nonprofits to vie for it and it's a very elaborate process they have to make sure you have the financial backing the experience all of that and we we had uh, I think two two lighthouses at the time little go went up for adoption but what had happened is it had been given to another nonprofit previously who gave it back oh. and giving it back meant that the federal government had done its good deed, and now it could just auction it for as much money as possible. So we got all of our school kids to write letters, and we said the highest and best use is for us to take it on. We would, we love this lighthouse. We will take care of it. And they said, "Sorry, it's going up for auction." But in two days, the public donated about um, one hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars. Two days wow. for this campaign to buy Little Go. And we were in the the lead in the um, auction for about um, fifteen minutes, ten minutes, oh. and it went for uh, over three hundred, maybe three hundred sixty-five thousand to a private individual. A great guy. Guess what? He died, and now the family is going to sell it. We don't know what's going to happen. So it's uh, so this this uh, man in the pi in the picture is one of the. Uh, captains on the ferry that goes to Plum Island, he uh, said, you know, I've spoken with the family. If you want to take some public tours on one weekend, we can do it. And we used the very, very fancy uh, high-speed ferry for uh, Fisher's Island. And it was expensive, you know, but how do you get in there? Right? How do you do it? We set it up very quickly. They sold out immediately. We had to add, I think, I think two more tours, so we had four tours all together. It's all all we could manage, and um, it was a thrill. It was a thr it was so the future fantastic. is still in limbo of yes. related to the ownership, eventual exactly. ownership of exactly. this lighthouse because the estate is being settled and the people want to sell it. So I've let um, uh, them know that we would. They could get a tax deduction probably in that bracket, and that we could try to raise money to buy it. Because, you know, where the Atlantic, where the Long Island Sound opens up to the Atlantic, just where um, Fisher's Island is and Race Rock, on the other side of that opening is Little Go. Little Go is, I think, 1804. It's a very old, beautiful, wow. beautiful lighthouse, and it has a very interesting history. It had a building, a keeper's dwelling, that really very much resembled a uh, ledge lighthouse. Um, oh, wow. But that came down in a hurricane and then was torn down, so it stormed some time. But, you know, all of them worked together, and that, that group of four, the two where it opens to the Atlantic, uh, ledge light, harbor light, that is the goal. That is a, a goal for us, if we could have those. But the three is pretty darn great. Yeah, so three last, is really great, and and to have at least occasional access to yeah. Gull Island is is nice too. To have at least have some kind of a relationship with the owners that, whether or not you know you can purchase it in the future, you know or having that relationship mean? could be really helpful. Yeah, it is, and um, you know we've had every t every two years until COVID. We have we have tried to bring together all of the lighthouse owners. It's not it's a public meeting, but it's more for people who really own lighthouses, like the people who own Orient Point and you know uh, Saybrook Point, and the uh, all all of those people come, and it's not a large group, and we discuss uh, best practices and you know problems and who to contact. And we, we've done three of these meetings so far, and they've been great. And I hope we'll do one, well, we'll plan to do one, uh, depending on the 
uh, viral uh, status. Yeah, we knew. Yeah. You know, we'll plan to do one this this spring because we, we really have to get back together. And, and people have, you, you know, um, lighthouses are, when they were built, when they were built, they guarded the shipping, and the shipping was the whole economy for the world. And the individual lighthouses are constructed like a very elaborate puzzle. And, and it's not that they have windows in them. They have windows that are fashioned in a certain way. So we have, um, you know, you have to respect that when you do your restoration. The, uh, there, there are so many little things that the, um, what would you call it, the uh, traditional lore or the, what do you call it, the history of the place has been lost by taking the keepers out of there. Just right. the presence of someone to keep their eye on things, but to know what the, what the maintenance requirements are, you know, for things like the lights in the lantern room. Uh, the, the windows in the lantern room. All of that is kind of lost. Institutional memory is what I'm trying to say. And um, by having this group, we can bring that back as much as possible. And when there's a problem, you know, the, the problems are, uh, you know, you're in a place that's like right on the edge of the water, and it's gorgeous and it's treacherous at the same time. And you have all this people love and they think it's so romantic, but then you have the entropy of the Coast Guard not doing anything for decades. And you have to kind of face that and not face it and just slap something on and say, well, at least it's not going to leak. You have to do the research to go back and understand why it is the way it is. And if you're doing real preservation, you want to restore it the way it was and continue the maintenance on a regular schedule if you can do it. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's tricky, but I know more than I ever thought I would about lighthouses <laughs> at this point. Well, in, in general, yeah. I think historic preservation is something that in this part of the United States, we really should be uh, you know, taking a lot of uh, attention and time to find out about. Yeah. And I, I said this repeatedly that, you know, I know there are parts of Europe, parts of the Middle East, parts of Asia that are much older than, you know, or South America, they're much older yeah. than New England. But within the continental U.S., yeah. this is where a lot of the oldest stuff is. Uh, you know, my in-laws on the West Coast always kind of marvel that, you know, our house that was built in 1890, yeah. they think that's amazing, but by New London standards, yeah. you know, it's Relatively. kind of ho-hum. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of houses in New London still standing that were built in the 1890s. And so I, I feel as though if we can't keep that legacy going, here, then the United States is just going to lose it. <laughs> but you know, 1890s, there's a lot of character intrinsic in that. And, and, and you know, you could have somebody come in and just say, well, bleh, bleh, this is not efficient. But that's not the way you do it either. You want to understand it. And um, that, that's what we've tried to do. And we've done a good job so far at Harbor Light. I can't say it's perfect, but we're doing, we're doing our best. And, um, Grace Rock we're attacking next year in a big way. So so what are the plans for Race Rock? Race Rock, um, we had this group, it's Walter Sedovic Architects, um, go out and do a preservation study and they put it into three different phases. And phase one is to make it safe for people to be out there. Um, <clears throat> what that means is uh, replacing the railing and doing the, there, yeah, there are some people, and that young woman in the front with the sort of checkered pocketbook mm -hmm. and her dad are from a, uh, a foundation 
uh, I don't know where they're based because they live all over the world. They're just oh, wow. amazing. But they, that young girl decided to give us $100,000 out of the blue. We had to apply, of course. Right. But, um, you know, we <laughs> nice. had to say what we were going to do with it. And we, ha we had already commissioned this plan from these architects because that's how we do it. And um, they're going to uh, replace the railing, figure out a safer way for people to land, uh, the, the drum foundation, the big round foundation yeah. that T.A. Scott built that the lighthouse is on top of, is really, uh, you see, now this is where you could have screwed up. You could just put concrete on the top and say, that's it, we're sealing it. But actually, it's a very historic and pioneering and creative solution to how to build a platform for a lighthouse. It was one of the very first examples of poured concrete underwater. Oh, they wow. built it up like a layered like a, like a wedding cake in layers and uh, there are four or five different layers and then you have this foundation and um, when I wrote the because I don't know right I, I don't know and uh, I bet you know more now than you did when you started but when I wrote the application back in in the spring we hadn't had our final report from the architects and I but I knew that the categories and I knew we wanted to restore the railing, make it safe for people to work out there, and, and uh, re-grout the stonework. You know, I was like, phase one is just seal the perimeter and make it safe. And it's about $240,000. And, um, and so I, I, I had to write it because there was a deadline, and I said, this, 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 this is what we're going to do. Then I got the report from Walter and Jill, and I said, ooh, I was a little little incorrect because I'm not a, a right. architect and they have in fact work on, worked on the master plan for 24 different lighthouses so they have peeled back the layers and dealt with every problem you could have in a very holistic way with many 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 um, different different circumstances but basically there there was a standardization to how the lighthouses were built and then, um, if you look at, at like Harbor Light, it's very similar to, uh, oh, say, Brook Light and uh, uh, Faulkner's Island Light. They're all built by the same builder at the same time. And then Ledge Light, they say, oh, it's so unique. No, it's not unique. It's actually kind of similar to North Dumpling, very similar to Hudson Athens. They built they built them in a period in a style, and they would modify each greatly to each location. But the workings of it were essentially the same. The, the systems of it were essentially the same. It's really interesting. But so these guys really knew what they were doing. And I had to, to go back to the foundation and say, listen, this is basically correct. But the way we would do this is not to resurface the drum with concrete. We're going to put a, a, a layer on to preserve what's underneath because this is really important and at the time kind of groundbreaking technology and we're going to put a different surface on the top of that. So oh, that, that's how we learn and, and how we go forward. But that's, that's the plan for next year and we have to spend it next year. That's the deal. So there will be some intense work on that lighthouse. Yes, yes. And it's, it's really thrilling because it's, um, <coughs> it's, it's, not inaccessible. We were talking about it. Kayakers go out there all the time. I don't know how. But um, they're very brave, though, to do it. And um, we just have to make it easier for workmen to get out there. And once we, once we figure that out, the actual work will be much less expensive. And we want it to be safe for people who visit. And we've had a group on Fishers Island express that they want to start a committee and work with us. And oh, uh, great. yeah, so I, we're all for public input and everything, but we've just got to got to keep our eye on the way things are done. Yeah. So yeah, so uh, I learned a lot about lighthouses. Okay, so I do want people to. Uh, get an idea of what's going on in the custom house too, which is the, you know, the, the building that is maybe most closely associated with, uh, 
with your organization. So here's a oh yeah, insight. Third, it was a, a couple hours ago that was filled with third graders. Christina Corcoran, our president, um, has been teaching the local history and landmarks program in the schools. Um, it, it was for it was started by uh, Jody Bartell, who was a teacher in the public schools, and she. Um, couldn't deal with the COVID aspect. So Christina leapt in. Her son oh. was a videographer. They made very nice videos and did it remotely for a couple of years. And then they, um, this year she's doing sort of a hybrid. So she's been going into the schools. The teachers show the videos repeatedly, which is good. They know the skyline. They know the landmark buildings. They're, and they're third graders. And, and they do art projects. And But I will oh, say. Oh, yeah, and here are some. some some yeah, of the art. The, um, the, the artwork, though, you know, they don't have art teachers in the schools anymore. So Christina says it's not as wonderful as maybe it had been. And uh, that's a, but that's it is, a sad thing. Uh, Christina is an artist, though. So she is. So, yeah. She has that dimension of being able to relate to them. She does. Even she if is. she isn't an art teacher. Oh, no, no, no. She, 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 does, she does do that. But um, she is our secret weapon, in fact. She started the open <laughs> mic, which is a fabulous thing. And she's teaching this program. They came to the school, third graders. There have been three years without uh, field trips, so they've never been on a field trip. They are so excited. It was so crazy. <laughs> I'll tell you. And we have them, you know, they, she, you know she, she blew the foghorn for them. <laughs> they put on the sailor sailor jackets, you know, all, all of that stuff, and uh, it was it was a lot of fun. So they're coming again tomorrow. Oh, good! A different <laughs> group of third graders, right? A different right? group of third graders. It was Nathan Hale today. I, I'm thinking that, you know, they'll get more accustomed to field trips at some point. Yes. But yes. It, it isn't just, you know, the the younger students. It's I think it's kind of all of us are try starting to just feel our way into like doing things in person. Like you mentioned, you went to the Lighthouse Inn for dinner. And really, frankly, I've been out to dinner, I could count them on one hand since COVID hit. And yeah. not that we did that much, but it's a whole other mentality you have. And uh, you know, my mother's 93, so we're very careful about her. and. Um, you know, it's just we're still in that uh, odd phase of things. We are, and, and and you know, even when we had our Riverside Park event this last September, oh. after we canceled it for two years, yeah. we really scaled back, and some of the most popular activities for uh, we eliminated because we didn't want to encourage like people to be in crowds or be standing yeah. in line. Yeah, yeah. So we had to kind of figure out what to do that had people scattering. So we had art supplies for students so that they could walk around and they, you know, we had watercolors or... Yeah, yeah. nice. But yeah. we didn't do some of the things that, that you know, the, the, the gentleman who did magic, a magic show in the past afterwards got in touch with me and he was uh, disappointed we hadn't called him yeah and I said it, it isn't that we don't want you but when you perform all these young kids are crowding and you know this is an event that we hold a few, only a couple weeks after school starts we had no idea what the COVID situation would be like two or three weeks after the first day of school and it's been bad and I've personally know more people who've had COVID the last couple months than I did through the whole last couple years. So I, what, I don't know what's going and on. All the other, yeah. And all the other things too, yeah. the yeah. RSV and the, the flu yeah. viruses. Yeah. I, I, I don't know, maybe because the last couple of years people were so careful and didn't yeah. expose to anything, uh, masked everywhere, n hardly ever when shop, you know, if you went yeah, shopping, yeah. you got curb pickup. Six in the morning. Yeah. And now suddenly, even those of us who aren't doing a whole lot of interacting, yeah. we're suddenly getting exposed to stuff our bodies haven't dealt with for the last couple couple yeah. years. Yeah. So if, if someone goes to the custom house, uh, you, you mentioned uh, 
you know, all the hands-on kinds of things that, that, that kids yeah. can do. Uh, now, you have a library there as well, yeah, right? Yeah, we have a great, uh, a great resource in that. Uh, it's the Frank L. McGuire uh, Maritime Research Library. So it's not open, but you can go in with a librarian, and right now it's Lori de Revita the last couple years and uh, Brian Rogers before that, and they both work together. They're putting uh, exhibitions online, and in fact, Lori just put one up. You know, we, uh, uh, I'm the only employee. Everybody else is a volunteer, but people love the museum, and they're always giving us wonderful things, even though, you know, uh, 50 years ago, or what, it, maybe 90 years ago, whenever uh, Mystic Seaport started, a lot of the great goods from New London ended up at the seaport. People have held on to things, and they've been giving things to us at a pretty rapid clip. And we're, we're pretty good stewards. We get them. We have a good collections room. Everything is, is kept to standards. But we, don't ha we haven't had a collections person all this time. So we have someone who has started to work on a part-time basis. And what happened is through the collections, we were, we were offered an opportunity to uh, apply for a grant. And they would have taken a small group of photographs for a photo class to use as a demonstration collection. So Lori and I got together and started looking at all the pictures. And they were all over the place. They were in files, you know, filed in files, not just randomly in files. But they were on the walls. They were in scrapbooks. And, and people, uh, people come in, and they just leave things. They put it through the mail slot with no information. So, you know, and, and, and it's a question when we're looking at it, like, what is a photograph? We have photos, we have copy photos, we have this incredible collection called the Cone Collection. A man, Harold Cone, who was a historian, um, kept records of the shipping news of New London, going back to the early 1800s, really, handwritten. He wrote it out of the newspapers. He has a lot of clippings, he has photos, and he has some really solid photo files of the construction of the State Pier, which is uh, Brian Rogers did a really wonderful sort of a timeline uh, exhibition online about that. Um, so we have all these, all these different things. We have from the artist Ellery Thompson. It was Morgan McGinley gave us a collection of photographs of his paintings that he painted over. So what's the line? Is it, is it a photograph? Is it an artwork? So I've put together, and I still have to do the captions, uh, a new exhibition upstairs about sm the small photo collection. And not, they're not necessarily small, and they're not necessarily what we call photos. Because then you go to these uh, incredible uh, articles that Harold Cohn saved. The newspaper articles with incredible pictures in them. So it's all, it's all perplexing and fun, and it really warrants our attention to, to look at this in a way we hadn't looked at before. And what we're going to do is invite local historians in, and I haven't quite figured out how we're going to do it. But we have these albums, and they're full of pictures, and maybe a third of them are, you know, a hurricane or something like that on the waterfront. But two-thirds of them are different streets in New London and people out on picnics or riding a bicycle. Wow. And it, it's not something I know. And, but people do. You know, there are those Facebook pages. And you put up a picture, and zam, 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 you get 50 comments about it. And I know there's a, a, a crowd out there who knows so much about these things. And we'd love to get them in to help us with these collections. So that's one of the new things we have. We have a wonderful gift shop. Remember that? Because uh, holidays yeah. <laughs> are here. And it's a fantastic little shop. So if you want to visit that, we'd, we'd love it. And then we have our permanent collection. And I'll let you in on a secret. We have a, a donation coming next Tuesday. It's a large model of the Amistad. Oh, wow. But it was made by a man who was a minister. And he was the head of what had been the Amistad Committee when they freed the 
the Amistad Africans. It continued for many years. And this man was the head of that group. And he made this model, and his family decided to give it to us. So we're very, very excited about that and, and looking forward to it. And you know, the our museum is not, is not like a regular museum. It's, it's, so many people find these things so meaningful. And we think of ourselves more as a community museum. Now, we, we actually have a model of the Amistad that someone made. And it's a, a small, but you know, it's adequate for our purposes. We have a really big, wonderful exhibition. But the fact, I mean, maybe we're just too, we're not hard-hearted enough to turn <laughs> things away. But this model will be wonderful. And it has the added dimension, the personal dimension, and the story to the family, and all the way back to the actual Amistad incident. So that's thrilling, you know, it's great. Now, if people want to visit the museum, like, when are you open? <laughs> well, we're just about to close for two weeks. So we're taking a break from uh, uh, Christmas Eve, we'll be closed. So we're open on the Friday the 23rd, then we'll be closed for two weeks, and we open again January 11th. But that being said, we're open uh, Wednesdays 10 to 5, Saturdays 10 to 5, and uh, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday 1 to 5. So we've expanded our hours this year. We have a few more volunteers. And they love it, but they're very lonely there sometimes because there's just not the traffic downtown. And I spoke with Felix Reyes about it, and he said, you know, maybe we have to stay open later for people who come to go to the restaurants because there's not apparently new uh, shops coming in downtown, but there are like three restaurants set to open. So I know that um, Jenny across the street with uh, noodles and rice, they're opening a sushi restaurant where Lazy Leopard used to be in a couple of months. Oh, that's nice to hear. I know, <laughs> I know. So it's, you know, we, we love the restaurants, but, you know, maybe we have to tailor what we do. So that's something we're going to be talking about over the break with the docents. And um, so we open up with those hours on the 11th. On the 13th, we're having the wine taste, the famous uh, long anticipated wine tasting that was supposed to be at the Lighthouse Inn. We could just never get it going with them. We ended up with a champagne toast, wonderful. You had the picture with the cake. Um, we're going to have a wine tasting at the Custom House. We just got the liquor permit, special event oh permit, yeah. <laughs> today. We applied, you know, a couple weeks ago. We got it today. We're all set for the 13th, Friday the 13th. Switch your luck. Come yeah, to the Yeah, really, and come to the Custom House. Custom the Custom House. So we're, we're thrilled about that. Well. So if people want to, I, obviously, if you can go to the, the website, mm -hmm. uh, nlmaritimesociety.org, yeah. and there's a calendar of events, and there's a lot yeah. of information about but, how to get involved. But how can people get more involved or be supportive uh, of well, your, and then you can yeah. finish your sentence. The, yeah, yeah. The, webs, the website is pretty good, and I update the page with the Harbor Cam. Everybody loves We have 3.4 million viewers of, of the, the Harbor, Harbor Cam. Cam. Can you believe that? That is like the number. I, I, it, and it just flipped from 3.3 .3 to 3.4 after a couple of months. I cannot believe how popular that is. COVID might have actually helped that. Yes. Even it was, though it didn't help a lot. Yeah, it helped a couple of things with us. It helped a, a volunteer project we had, a transcription project. It was just, it's weird, isn't it? It's funny. It, it, there's no bad that doesn't have some good yeah. turn, maybe, somewhere. But um, the, the best way to keep up with the activities is to go on the website and sign up for our weekly email blast. And it's nice. Uh, to, this week, it starts with a big smiling picture of uh, <laughs> Margaret Palmer, oh. ha, you know, Hosschild. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're very local. We have our, uh, we have events all the time, uh, community events, and most of them are free, like Jaboom, and we have an open mic that Christina does that's really successful. You can watch that. It, pr it streams on uh, her Facebook page. And uh, you can participate for free. It's kind of great. She was going to start one for youth. I don't know if she will. It's, it, maybe not in the winter. 
And then we have uh, something called Jaboom, which also doesn't run in the winter. Uh, but it's for seniors, people who are home during the day. It's uh, 1 o'clock on uh, the third Tuesday of the month. And we have all kinds of wonderful speakers. The last one actually was an authority on submarines, and he scared us to death. <laughs> about that I find thing. submarines scary anyway. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was a, it was a, it was a very uh, interesting, friendly talk. And at the end, what he told us was just... Um, Terrifying. So it's a, you never know what you're going to get. Now, are these Jaboom students. talks uh, streamed as well, or do you have to go in person? Well, you know, um, I am not as great with the. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and and we we streamed them for a while, and probably made more people angry than happy. Oh. So we'll try it again. We taped a couple of talks. Uh, we we had a, a couple of good talks that we did tape and put them up. And that wonderful Race Rock film you can link to on our, on our home page of the website. So, you know, that's something to aspire to in the new year. Now, we have four minutes left. Whoa. So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, just like, let people know, like, what they can do to be supportive? Do you need yeah. volunteers? Do you well, we need do. We donations? Love, do you we, need? Yeah, we love volunteers. And to tell you the truth, I, I will not. Um, you could be there for a four-hour shift, and no one could come into the museum. It's just not busy downtown. It's just not. Or you could get loads of people. So we like to have at least two docents at the museum at a time. And if you have a friend like you. We could do it together for four hours, bring a thermos of coffee and cookies and sit there and catch up. And, yeah. and we would love to have volunteers to help with that. But we have a lot of projects. We have our, our lighthouse committees. We have our um, <clears throat> special events, like the wine tasting coming up. We have um, uh, the, the woman who used to take care of cleaning our building has gotten ill. So we need people to help us with logistics of events and things like that. So you um, rent out the building as well. We do. It, it hasn't been too popular of late, but when things are better, we, we do do weddings and all kinds of things, and it's uh, a, a lot of fun. We have meetings. We had the Thames River Consortium there um, a, a couple months ago. It was pizza and beer. <laughs> it was good. It was fun. And, uh, you know, we're doing things all the time, and, and it's always nice to have people who can step in and help for a special event if they don't want to set up a regular schedule. But we'd like to expand our hours. We would love to have people who would be there, say, four to seven, uh, one night a week, and then we could maybe catch some of those people going yeah, to the dinner. Yeah, the dinner crowd. But we might wait to start that until March when the weather's a little better. Yeah. But we aspire to that, and we aspire to starting at 10 also on, uh, on Fridays, which can be a very good day for tourists passing through town. Sounds great. Well, thanks for coming on and talking to us. Rona, I love uh, it. Yes, and talking yeah. to us again and updating yeah. us on you know, what's old that's still happening and what's new uh, for the coming year. There's always the annual fund. You can always make a contribution to the annual fund. But I would say sign up for our weekly email blast. That will keep you up to date. You know, when we have these lighthouse tours, uh, they some of them, the limited ones, sell out immediately because people are really waiting, waiting, waiting to visit some of these places. So that'll keep you up to date. And our, our wine tasting is limited, too, because it's at the Custom House. So we'll have that up online very soon. Well. Thanks again. And, nice uh, to see you. Yeah, nice to see you too. It's been a year and a little, I think. Uh, Since Juneteenth. Oh, we actually, uh, and oh, I no. think we saw at Sailfest, we Sailfest. did see each other. Yeah, so talk. there have been brief sightings, but yes. it's been a while since we've gotten a chance to sit and talk. Yeah. And I loved you know, talking about the resources in New London. So New next, London's great. Yeah, it is. There's so much. There's so much. And, uh, yeah. 
And next week we will continue. I am not sure who the guests are. We're scheduling things, but we'll be continuing uh, to talk to people doing, uh, working for nonprofits that are working in New London. So we will see you then. Thank, you. thank you again, Susan. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I love the Green Party. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> it's a big, it's a big uh, task. <laughs>